All right, so today's video, we're back with Reddit Reacts. I feel like it's been a little bit. I, I do like doing these videos, so I definitely want to do more of them, but usually we just kind of, you know, get some Reddit uh, Reacts linked to us, and we go through and just kind of react to what it's about. Uh, usually it's questions about Overwatch and things that are, you know, about the game or theory, etc. So it's pretty cool. I enjoy it. It's always fun talking about Overwatch, you know? So the first uh, one we have today is from Radiant Section, talking about, I feel like the community underestimates the metal ranks when given advice to improve. Well, this is a good one, because obviously I do a lot of spectating stuff. They say, I'm a silver slash gold old player most seasons climbed into plat once many seasons ago and i've been lurking here for quite some time to get some tips i often check out vod reviews on heroes in a similar rank to mine in order to glean some insight on how to play better one thing i've noticed that along with really solid advice that people dish out there's a lot of underestimations underestimations holy crap of the abilities and awareness of players in these low ranks I get it. We low-ranked players obviously play the game much worse than higher-ranked players, and yes, game sense and general awareness is an issue across the board. However, some of the things I've heard people say about people down here in the ELO slums don't match up with my experience at all. For example, a common thing I hear from people is that low-ranked players never pay attention to a Yari's pylon, which just isn't true in the slightest. I play a lot of a Yari, and my pylon gets focused instantly if it's in a bad position. Even when I do put it in a good position, red team member will often look for a cheeky angle to hit it or use their abilities to get a position to specifically destroy the pylon. I would say that in 95% of the games I play Ayari, I feel like my pylon is being hunted and I have to be super careful where I place it. Now, I do want to I do want to point this out here with, with the Ayari pylon and maybe it's just how I see it. I, I think sometimes when you're playing Ayari, when you're pylon gets destroyed it becomes way more obvious in comparison to when your your pylon has massive amounts of uptime right so it either sounds like what's happening here is they just have bad pylon placement or when they do get their pylon destroyed it's like oh my pylon's getting destroyed so it's not that you're not you're not, you're not wrong in that sense it's just like i don't i don't even know where the pylon discussion comes into play here when it comes to that because it's also just going to go from rank game to rank game like sometimes you'll play a rank game where players will destroy your pylon and they'll be very active about destroying your pylon in other games, it won't matter as much, right? Like, it just, the, the other team doesn't want to shoot the pylon, etc. Like, for example, you hear me talk about all the time where I cannot get my teammates in top 500 to kill sim turrets. But when I go and play sim, my sim turrets get destroyed. So what does that mean? I, for me on sim, it generally means I probably just have bad sim turret placement. Why I think it's good sim turret placement, it's probably bad right? Just because I, I don't know what I'm doing on. And yeah, I, I'm the same way, by the way. I always look to kill pylons. I always look to kill it. So it could just be, you could go 10 games in a row playing against players who just want to go in and just have team fights and don't want to kill any deployables. And then you have 10 games in a row where people always look for the deployables, right? Does that make sense? It's a, I, I'm not saying they're even, they're even wrong here. It's just that I think that sometimes it just each game will play differently and sometimes your pylon will get destroyed and sometimes it won't. And it also could just mean that your pylon also, I don't know, it just might not be the best pylons either, right? And it could be meta too. Maybe if you're playing against D.Va a lot, like it's more common a D.Va might be able to kill a pylon because the is going to be more aggressive into your back line, things like that. So it, it's definitely an interesting discussion though. I, I get what's being said here, but I, I think like the reason why I personally bring up killing pylons, et cetera, is also to get people in the habit of killing pylons and killing sim turrets because I, I see it happen so much where players don't kill them. So maybe players are just getting better at killing the pylons now too, right? You never know. Maybe people just got, maybe people have improved over time on that one. But I think I still think it's good to get people in the habit of doing that. Anyway, another example. People often say that low ranks tend not to target squishies and only shoot the tank. Once again, as a support main, this does not line up with my experience. I get targeted constantly and find that people often are targeting me first before anyone else, especially the red team DPS. Now, clearly, low rank players still make a ton of mistakes, myself included, and that's why we are down here in the first place. But I feel some of the misconceptions of how lower rank players actually play from higher rank players given advice is a little odd. Is it just because high rank players haven't been down in the muck for so long that they haven't realized how much the overall community has improved over time? Curious what your take is. Yeah, I mean, like, that's something that I've had to do over time is as I've done more spectators, truthfully, I've had to adapt how I give the feedback. So I think sometimes, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe maybe my spectators have gotten, I'm going to be a little bit biased here, but I feel like my spectators have gotten a little bit better. And a lot of that too is also understanding like, you notice how I don't hard focus high ground as much anymore, right? I agree that high ground is important. I, 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 why I agree high ground is important. I also understand that getting your teammates to work with you high ground is a problem. So I've, I've kind of shifted it to getting the mindset of taking high ground if it's feasible, but don't stay up there if your teammates aren't coming with you, right? Play at the same pace. So I, I, I understand that maybe a lot of it just like comes with experience of like high ranked players just seeing more VODs because with me and spectating, the more I've watched VODs, the more I start to understand, okay, yes, while this will apply in top 500, this, I, I, I can't, 
expect this to be applied in goal. I think that's more along the lines of what happens is that in top 500, you're so used to playing a certain way that when you go to gold, you're like, oh, they should go do that now too. But in reality, it's it's that's why I talk about a lot of players in in silver, gold, bronze, etc. It's about getting the basics down, and then you you complicate it more as you climb, rather than like do this, 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 and this, because there's no guarantee that if I tell you to go do this, this, and this, oh, play this hero because this hero is dominated in top 500. It doesn't mean you're gonna get the same support. You're not gonna have the same DPS. You're not gonna have the same map control. You're not gonna have the same positioning. That's why, like, when I do the the reviews now, I try to take all of that into account, and that's why some of the advice could be as simple as. Yo, you're throwing your honor grenades terribly. You got to clean that up. Start with the basics. I just think that another thing to add to this is I think it's, I don't even think it's underestimates. I think it's just the way that people play is different. So their play style could just be different too, right? Like if you find that you're getting targeted all the time on support, like these ranks, it could very much be that your position is just too aggressive, right? And if they had more passive position and as a support, they may not get dove as much or killed as much by the other tank because they have to go so far to get them. It just, there's a lot there is basically what I'm saying. Anyway, I want to see what this number one common is and then we'll go from there. I kind of understand what OP is saying here. The community has improved as a whole. Silver and gold today are much better players than they were a couple years ago. I mean, that's true in general, yeah. However, as someone who has gotten some VOD reviews from really high-ranked players in this sub, you have to respect and realize just how differently they think through the game. A master's ranked player is going to look at my gameplay, I'm a fellow gold pleb, LOL, and instantly see massive mistakes that they don't even have to actively think about correcting when they play, because it's second nature to them, which... I bring up again, the basics, the fundamentals. Everything happens more quickly at higher ranks, so the decision making and the execution of high rank players is impressive. So when they see an Ayari pylon that is targetable in a low elo game, they often probably think I would have killed that pylon by now, which in turn causes them to say things like people don't shoot Ayari turrets in low ranks. Perhaps it's a little overgeneralized, but I think it's more for ease of conveying their tips slash feedback. I wouldn't take it as offensive not saying you are. It's just their perspective is so different from having that elite level reaction time, decision making process, aim, etc. Which, once again, going back to what I was saying here, that's why I talk about the fundamentals. Because if you get those right, then everything else comes with time. And I always talk about how the game, even though they, it's funny because what, what this comment says is that everything is so fast when you play in that. But the funny part about that is why the game plays quicker, right? At higher ranks, as you get better as a player, everything actually slows down. And you go, what do you mean it slows down? Not the gameplay, but how you process everything. It's in like slow motion. Does that make sense? Anytime I improve at a game, it goes from feeling really fast to going in slow motion. Where like it's, while it's fast when you're doing it, it's, it, it doesn't feel that way. That also, as you get better, you'll see that happen too. All right, this one is from, I like how the, the, the name is Taylor Swift fan. Uh, they say, I'm a new player and I feel completely useless 90% of the time. I have no idea what I'm doing or how to actually be useful. I've been playing Life Weaver because a friend of, of a friend said I should, but I should probably stop and play something else because I'm awful with all of his abilities. I'm just getting non-stop abuse for pulling people or not pulling people. Sometimes I'm too slow with it. And other times I pull someone standing in front of, or behind the guy I want. No one ever really uses my platform platforms and I struggle to figure out when to actually use his ult and not have it be a waste. A lot of the time I struggle to actually keep people healed up and do enough healing that actually matters or people run out of my sight so I can't heal them and then they die. I die a ton to people like D.Va or the hamster just running through my team to point blank me or someone running behind me and then just insta killing me. But if I stay closer to my team where people can help me I die to 400 other different things. When my team stomps I feel like a passenger. And when I lose, I feel like most of it is my fault. I don't know how to be useful and have an impact, and especially in the games where the, there's someone camping outside spawn to kill me, I just don't have much fun. I recorded a, f a, a few videos if it works, so it would be possible for someone to watch a couple of them and list off everything I'm doing wrong and what I should be doing instead. How much should I be playing before I start playing ranked? Should I give up on Life Weaver and play someone else? I haven't played quicker pace shooters in a long time and my aim is awful. I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about this one here. This is the number one thing I saw. I've been playing Life Weaver because a friend of a friend said I should. So let's start here. When you play Overwatch, the number one advice I will have for you is figure out what heroes you like because your friend may enjoy the play style. Your friend of a friend may enjoy a play style. It may not fit your play style. So the number one bit of advice I have here for you is go try and see the other heroes a bit more and see what you like. Because a lot of what's cool about Overwatch is there's right now, as of now, if you're, I mean, if you're watching this video in December, this, the hero number will be different, but there's 41 heroes in Overwatch, okay? So if you don't vibe with like the play style of Life Weaver and you're not having fun, try a different hero. Because I think that if you do that, you might find like it's a bit more fun. You say, oh, you know, my aim is really bad right now and, and you're playing support. Well, you know, maybe try, you know, I, I'll give you suggestions, but I, I want you to figure it out. Like heroes like Moira, you don't need the best aim and you can make really good plays. Lucio, you don't need the best aim unless you're diving Widows in the back line. And, and, and like, like I said, there's a lot of difference between top 500 Lucio and like bronze Lucio. 
right? The point I'm basically saying here is try other heroes and see what you like. I mean, heck, I'm gonna be honest with you. You may not even like playing Life Weaver or support. You might want, you might like playing Torb, right? Because, you know, you like the Torb turret and it helps a little bit with that and you can learn. So my advice to you and to anybody that runs into this issue is just try a different hero and see if you like that hero. I, I promise, like, not promise, but you, you might find a hero you like. Um, that goes for anything, like MMOs. Like, it, you know, it takes me a bit to find what character I want to play. Not because I think the character's bad, but just because it doesn't fit my play style. So try that out. See what happens. That, that, that's, that's the advice I got here. Um, what was the number one comment? Someone says, in my opinion, Life Weaver is a very difficult hero to start out with since he requires pretty good game sense to execute a pull properly. I personally say it's probably better to try out different heroes and see if you feel more comfortable with any of those. 100% agree. And yeah, Mr. Heroes could be good for that too. Okay, next one. This one says, why can't I do that? That's a funny one. Okay, uh, so the the blessed navel says, how do, how does say Frogger pull off the stuff he does? Dive in people and eliminating them at high level. When I watch his content, it's like he's playing against clueless people. In my games, the enemies seem to hear Lucio from spawn and immediately snap their attention to me. Or they have three people peel for them. What gives? I'm low masters and I don't Reddit Lucio. I love watching Frogger, but lean much closer to at the SK style of play. I just don't understand how he gets away with it from an enemy perspective. It's like he's playing against blind slash deaf people half the time. If I even get closer to high masters, I got absolutely punished if I try and deviate from my team. The enemy team plays tight, they peel, they target vulnerable targets, etc. Sigh. Okay, Frogger's just good at Lucio and has been doing it for years. That's kind of a good way to explain this. You're going to have moments on Lucio where you're going to get punished, and you're going to have moments where Lucio will go make a play. I think what makes Frogger really, really good at DPS Lucio, like when he goes in and does the DPS Lucio, is that he just, he has really good timings. And I think that's a lot of like where you're, you're probably not able to do the same thing, is that your timings just aren't the same, right? Because not only does Frogger have like unreal mechanics, but like Frogger knows when to go in. Like, like a lot of time, if you watch Frogger, for example, you're not going to see Frogger go in 28 times in a row and get 28 deaths, right? Frogger's going to time it out. Like, okay, we're going in. We're working together as a team. And then Frogger will be like, okay, this is my timing. I see that the the, 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 the team fight's engaged. You don't need me for a second. Wall rides off, goes off, kills a widow. You see what I'm saying? He's not just running it down mid, trying to kill a widow. You know what I'm saying? I think that's what happens here is that a lot of what Frogger does is timing based. So you have to, a lot of that experience comes with that timing and figuring out when the right time is to go for the kills, not just force the kills the whole time. And it sounds like when you say you get absolutely punished if you try and deviate from your team, it just sounds like, to me, your timings are off. And that's really what it is. So if you're trying to learn in that sense of like, okay, I want to watch these like really good Lucio players, watch their timings and also understand that there's definitely different play styles. You mentioned like, oh, you, you lean closer to the SK style of play great but you know at times she also gets aggressive based off of timings if you watch like funny astro same concept timings doesn't always go for the kills but knows the timings so i think that's really where you're, you're struggling is just your timings are off someone says here one thing to note that his videos are highlights agreed he uploads the funny slash goofy games where he can carry if you watch him live you'll see the struggle he gets hard punished and sometimes he just can't do anything all game and if you watch him play in owcs he plays a lot more safe he doesn't feed or overextend that much and his beat timing is very very good yeah I mean, that's, that's kind of how it goes too, right? Obviously, when it's highlights of that. But once again, I think the time. How do you learn the timing? It's learning from the mistakes that you do when you go in there. So this player keeps saying they get punished, but they, they're not saying why they get punished, right? Well, I mean, technically they are. They say they have three people peel, but why? Why are the three people peeling? I think once this player starts to figure out why the players are peeling so quickly, then they'll get a lot easier at understanding their timing. But until they recognize that, that's where it's going to be a problem. Like when they go in, why are they all peeling? If... If they're going in and they're all peeling right away, that sounds to me like the team fight hasn't quite engaged yet. So when you're going in to dive them and they're peeling, well, what's the reason they're peeling? If the team fight and the timing is correct, you probably won't have to deal with the peel. Does that make sense? That, that's where they'd have to improve on that one. Next one we have here is from uh, Bandicoot. They say, hot take. The scoreboard is important, actually. Everyone in the sub keeps saying things like stats aren't important or ignore the scoreboard. This is actually dumb and bad, and rejecting even limited data sets like those provided by the scoreboard is cheating yourself. There is a story in the data, and it's important to learn how to find the truth. True, the raw numbers tell an incomplete story, but through deduction and reasoning, you can learn what's going on, especially if you factor in your experiences in-game. That's my hot take. Please do not reject sources of information and complex systems. This is not, this, this doesn't just apply to Overwatch but elsewhere in life. TLDR incomplete data sets are not inherently valid. Well, one, it sounds like they work with a lot of data, which is cool. I want to think of a way to explain this because yes, you can learn a lot from the scoreboard. It's understanding what to learn from the scoreboard. Does that make sense? So when people say that the stats aren't important, I, I think that a lot of people are mentioning that like when you hit tab and then you're at a half and you go, oh, the other support has 5,000 more healing. What are you doing? Well, there's more context to that, right? Does that make sense? So I think what they're trying to say to you, and maybe they are saying, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm basically just like saying something similar. It's 
It's that people look at the scoreboard but use the stats the wrong way. They don't they don't look at the stats and go, oh, my widow is 10 and 10. Why is my widow 10 and 10? Is it because they suck or is it because of this? And most players just go to, oh, they suck. But in reality, it could be as simple as our tank isn't peeling. But people aren't looking at it that way. They look purely at the numbers, right? And I think that's what people mean by the scoreboard doesn't tell the whole story. But then what they're saying is that you can you can you can figure out that story with the scoreboard. Well, yes, but how can you get that going when a lot of players aren't even like there's a lot there's a lot more to it, right? It's like for example, they have a Roadhog and their supports have 5,000 more healing and you're saying, oh, well, wait a second. They have more healing. What's going on? It's because they have a Roadhog. Like their Roadhog is just feeding and they're, they're going to get healed more. Just like your teammates will have more damage than the other team. So they go, oh, I have 20,000 damage. What are you doing? But the other team has 10,000 damage, but they're winning. That has nothing to do with your damage. You're just farming a hog. So I get what they're saying. But like when people say the stats aren't important or ignore the scoreboard, I think more of what people are saying is like, don't just sit there and go, oh, my, my, you know, my widow's nine and seven. You're terrible. You suck. What are you doing? Because in reality, there could be more to it. Like, oh, my widow's nine and seven. But if I help heal for my widow, maybe my widow's 15 and three. Right? Maybe my widow can improve because there's something happening that I'm not seeing. Now, if they're losing the widow 1v1, that's just like you can see it in the kill feed, right? If I hit tab and I see that the other supports have way less healing, I understand what's happening is that we're either not doing as much damage or they're just like the team fights end quickly. Like my widow headshots and boom, you can't heal that, right? So there's a lot there. So I get what they're saying. I just think it's it's more along the lines of you would probably have to have a more like a deeper discussion on this one. Uh, number one comment says, only stat that remotely matters is death, I think. If someone has two times the death as the rest of their team, that's a pretty good chance they are the weak link. Yeah, but like, even then, they say this, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean all of that either, right? Like, you might have a team fight where that person gets killed every single team fight, but they always put so much pressure on the other team. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, if, if, if your teammates have 25 deaths, there's going to be a, an issue there, right? But it, it's, all, it's, it's all just context of what's happening in the game. And I think that's more the important part of this, is that you can learn stuff from the scoreboard, but there's also, you have to then take the, what you see in the scoreboard and take it to the next level of context and then create the story of the game. Players skip that whole step and just go right to the stats themselves. Like, oh, five and five, you suck. Right? That's not what you want to do. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Next up, we have uh, Nizen saying, people keep saying, stop hacking health packs on Sombra. Why? I keep seeing this advice from really high-ranked players, including top 50 Sombra mains, but I don't understand it. I understand not AFKing on a health pack as Sombra. Don't get me wrong. But some Sombra main was doing a VOD review, and when the person he was watching hacked a Mega, he was like, you shouldn't really hack health packs. But why? It literally has no downside, or am I crazy? P.S. This advice is recent within three months. So it was not from before the rework when Sombra used to have her old translocator or anything. I'm not a Sombra main, so my advice may not be the same of what a Sombra main is. I'm always in the mindset of this. If the if the health pack is hackable and like it, you're not going out of your way to take the health packs over, hack the health pack. Even as a tank player, you're going to help me a ton. Like as a tank player, I like that. But what I mean is, and maybe it's a way that they, they went about the advice here. I think what they're saying is, okay, let's say that you're playing Midtown. And you know, you know, like the little bridge area on second point, there's a little mini to the, to the side, right? You may not want to go out of your way to hack that health pack if it means they're going to kill you. But like, if there's a mega near your tank, I will gladly take a hacked health pack. If we're playing Hanaoka, please take the one mega on the side on the middle point. Let me have that. Let me control that health pack. We don't even need to use it. It just denies the health pack from the other team. Right. So I think maybe the advice there was not necessarily don't go out of your way to like control 20 health packs. But like I wouldn't not hack health packs if like they are useful to your team. I hope that's helpful. Uh, it should be the lowest thing on your priority list unless you specifically hack one to TP two after going for a kill. If anyone is fighting you, you should be trying to fight solo. But if no one is fighting you, you can hack packs. Exactly. Route 66 first point defense is a great example of this. You can hack two megas and two minis in about 10 seconds between fights. Those are important health packs that always use, that people always use in denying the enemy those can secure kills. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, and then they talked about like the, the health pack numbers here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what it is. Like, I think that's where the, I think, I think what's happening here is like the advice is getting, it's not don't hack health packs. It's don't go out of your way to hack health packs just to have 20 health packs. Deny the health packs that matter when you're waiting on like a rotation to go back in again. Hack those health packs. Have them available to your team if they help your team or they can deny the other team. But don't go and take 20 health packs is basically what it is. Okay, next up we have when people say to die on cart, should I still try to live as long as possible on cart? On defense, I understand that often it's better to just die on cart instead of trying to back out of the fight. But should I use my cooldowns to try to live as long as possible on cart before I die? Is there any disadvantage to lamp and shift myself on bat before I die to stall the cart, even if it does take longer for me to group up with my team for the next fight? Good question. It's a little bit different now. So let, let me kind of go. There, there's there's multiple layers to this. My 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 style of dive on on or die on cart is you, you first of all, you, you die on the cart so that way you stop the cart and you respawn together. But with the new wave respawn, there's a little bit more to it. And I I haven't even reached this level yet, so I don't I I think it will take time for 
a lot of players. Wave respawn, pay attention to the wave respawn. If you can get into the wave respawn, die ASAP on the cart to guarantee you spawn up quicker. If you're not going to hit a wave respawn, I think it's okay to extend your cooldowns a little bit on cart to give your other four teammates time to pre-plan, and then you'll spawn up after no matter what, right? It's, it's dependent on that. So I think it, what takes precedent now is your wave respawn. Then there's other things like, if I go on cart, do I know they just use a support ultimate? Do I want to use some like major cooldowns on the cart that could give them 15% extra ult charge? Like there's a whole layer to it. But I think right now the, the basic ABCs of it is you die on cart to give your teammates time to respawn. If you have a wave respawn that you can be a part of, that will be a quicker respawn. You die in the cart immediately. If you're not going to hit a wave respawn and like you just need a little bit of time, you can use a couple cooldowns. Are you going to feed L charge? Do you need L charge? Things like that. It's, there's no like clear cut way to it. But the reason why you die in cart is just to give yourself another regroup and give them no objective progress. Um, and the number one comment here says, I think with a new team respawn feature, it's best to die as fast as possible once you know the fight is lost. Every game this season, all my teammates scream, let's stagger. I will say the wave respawn is is going to be different though. So like if you're not aligned with the wave respawn, then then that's going to change your decision. But yeah, I think I think wave respawn takes precedent now. Good question. It's a good question. All right, this one we have um, from Jello Pud. They say, "What are some of the most useless callouts you've heard in game from serious teammates?" Hey, listen. What are you trying? What are you trying to say? What, if, if I'm taking offense to this, does that mean? Okay, uh, my duo partner and I have been playing together for years, and one of the most enjoyable things we like to chuckle between one another is the most useless callouts we hear over team chat from rando teammates. If the callout is so useless and funny, we then take it a step further by imitating them in following games to see other people's reaction. Just wondering what were some of the most useless callouts you've heard from serious teammates? I once had someone say, widow, no mine, and I never stopped thinking about it. Yeah, that's important, okay? I, I will say I definitely do a lot of fun callouts just for fun. I mean, there's there's going to be different types of callouts. Like, for example, do I need to say big slam? No. But do I have to say big slam? Yes. That's my answer, and we're leaving it at that. And then on to the last one we have here from Space Clown. They say, what are some commonly held beliefs about Overwatch that used to be true, but no longer are, but are still believed in? Inspired by my last game just now, playing Winston, where the enemy Reaper soft flamed me after losing, saying Winston didn't do well. I just paraphrased. And I couldn't tell if they were saying it because they thought I was terrible. I don't think I was since we won. Or because they swapped to Reaper to counter me and couldn't land one kill on me. I checked. Wow, they went deep here. I was reminded once again about how Reaper used to be hard counter Winston back in the Overwatch 1 days and that now he doesn't even bother me that much as Winston as long as I manage my cooldowns and keep my distance when low on health. I can handle Reaper just fine. And yet I keep seeing the Reaper swap when I'm doing well on Winston and I get like in this game where I see them pour cooldowns into me just for me to jump away. I understand other Winston mains are feeling much the same. Less talked about is that armor changes have made Reaper much less effective when facing Winston at full health, and with jump pack on a 5 second cooldown, the monkey will often get away before you get to the sweet monkey damage. So what other common misbeliefs are there used to be true and no longer are? What do we need to relearn or rethink? I, I've, I've been talking about this a lot. Armor has changed that, right? There's there's a lot less of the... Same thing with D.Va against Winston, right? It, it, I, I've been telling people, like, if they have armor, you're not going to have a good time against that, that tank. If they do have armor, if they have no armor left, you're going to shred them. But that's what they're trying to do now. They're trying to apply and create more soft counters, which I actually think, like, I think the way they're doing it now actually could lead to a much better, like, gameplay loop across the board. But I have have a feeling they'll eventually revert on a lot of this stuff and then it just will go back to reaper doing what reaper does but I, I i like the idea of it right like reaper doesn't counter winston like reaper used to uh one of the comments here says too many people still follow the don't shoot the zari bubble at all at all oh don't get me started chat knows my, my discussion here about where i always say that players tell people not to dps zarya but when you don't dps zarya zarya gets more map control and then eventually you have to shoot the zarya otherwise the zarya takes too much control and just shreds you once again with zarya bubble count bubbles a 100 charge Zarya out of position who gets killed is going to be better than like if you let a 50 energy Zarya just like just sit there with bubbles and you don't shoot a bubbles because you're just afraid to shoot bubbles because people don't say shoot bubbles. It's okay to shoot bubbles in the context that they are out of position. If a Zarya is out of position and killable, it's okay to do that because that's going to kill a Zarya. If you don't shoot a bubble and a lot of players won't, you give the Zarya too much map control and that's how you end up with the Zarya. Like people be like, oh, Who's charging the Zarya? It, it may not be what you think it is. I don't think it's a Junkrat just sitting there going, hey, is there a bubble? Let me spam the Zarya out. It's a lot of the time is eventually they just run out of room and they, they need to shoot the Zarya. And the Zarya gets charged over time because no one's shooting the Zarya. 
If I'm playing Zarya and no one shoots at me, I'm going to have a blast. I'm going to have an absolute blast. That's always been true, though? Yes, but, like, I think it's a little bit different now. People saying you can only play dive comms. A lot of this is, like, going to be opinion on, like, play style, too. I'm trying to think of one thing to add on to this. It's tough to say because there's been so many changes to Overwatch. I have one that I think would help a lot of players improve. Are you ready? And th this is more just an improvement for everybody. You don't need to play behind your tank like you're playing behind a Reinhardt, no matter who your tank is. A lot of players just want to stand behind their tank and they get mad that, like, their Arissa takes a bunch of damage or they're taking a bunch of damage, but a lot of players want to play behind their tank like they're playing behind a Reinhardt, okay? A lot of players want their Sigma to play like Reinhardt. They want their Sigma to go in. No, it doesn't work that way with Sigma. Sigma's a, a, a take areas of the map, not run in as Reinhardt. So I think I think that's something that over time now, it used to be you stand behind Rhine, you stand behind like, you know, even Arissa back in Overwatch 1 when there was more shields. Like, that's what you do. Like, you stay behind these shields. Nowadays, it's more taking angles and finding opportunities to do damage, not just stand behind somebody. So I, I think that's, I don't know if it's necessarily quite aligns with what's being talked about in this discussion, but I think it's a good point to bring up that stop standing behind your tank like they're, like they're Reinhardt. If you have a Zarya on your team, if you stand behind them, you might get a lot of damage on you. If you stand behind your Orisa, there might be a lot of damage. If you want your Sigma to move up and play like you're playing Reinhardt, it's going to take Sigma time. It's not as simple as how you play Reinhardt. Um, because a lot of players like the idea of staying staying behind Reinhardt, and just that's it. And they, they want every tank to play like that. We'll leave it at that. It's a good question. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. It actually kind of made me think about that more. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll figure out more as we go, but... Yeah, anyway, uh, if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. Uh, let me know what you think about Reddit Reacts. I mean, we've done them before. I, I want to do more of them, but let me know what you think if this is stuff you'd like to see more of. So do that. Like the video. Leave a comment. All that helps. We also record these live on stream. You can see the Twitch chat below the webcam uh, and the YouTube chat. Uh, we also stream on YouTube. Stop by if you want. We have a lot of fun here. And with that being said, I hope you all have an amazing day slash night. That, I, dude, I sucked at that outro, but it's all good.